Moo, and good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Pink Tron. I am Brent Robinson, and I am joined today by Chris Greenland. Chris, what are you drinking? I am drinking, although I didn't do much yet today, I did go on a couple of light spins. I am drinking a Recovery Miller Light. Very good. Very good. And we'll go to Steph. Steph, what are you drinking? Steph at Jen. Just uh, finishing up my recovery shake because I didn't do the you know, spring, and spring chickens race, but, uh, <laughs> but, but but I did a lot of race and uh, for the actual beer uh, at another who garden like last week. Very nice. nice. And I'm also joined by Steve Pritchard. Steve, what are you drinking? I, I have just finished no spring chicken, so I'm on uh, pure H2O at the moment. Um, and also sat in my bed trying not to die. So. It's yeah, a fun race, wasn't it, Sean? Yeah, Steve has been complaining <laughs> about has been complaining about chest pains for the last twenty minutes, thirty minutes now. <laughs> and that brings us to Sean Fogenberg. Sean, what are you drinking? Uh, I also raced that, but that does not mean I'm on pure H two O. I have a whole whole desk full i've got my uh recovery shake i've got a stash panda hazy ipa from hop valley it's a grapefruit uh hazy i've got a rabbit hole high gold uh small batch bourbon uh for when i'm done with that and then if i want more non-alcoholic stuff. I've got a uh, mango passion fruit kombucha. Uh, and even if I drink all of these, I think I'm still probably going to be a pound lighter than when I started the race because I I had a lake under me at the end of it. Is it, is it... I'm not I'm not staying on for round the horn, but this was going to be my potential round the horn topic of when when, when should you weigh yourself? Because I've I've dropped nearly two pounds. I, I quickly jumped on the scales before the ride, and I've jumped on them just out of the shower now, and I've lost close to a kilo. Um, we, may, we may still have to do that because I, I, I can tell you what I do, which is probably like not what you're 100% not supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, fi and finally, I think we've got John Keenan. John, what are you drinking? It's really, truly a mystery as John is. I know. I have no idea why my camera's not working, but uh, <laughs> I'm drinking hipster chocolate milk banned in Canada <laughs> from the Slate Cor Corporation. Um, yeah, still got a couple of those left and then probably move on to water. But... <laughs> I'm sure we could import it up here if we paid the proper amount of penance to the local monopoly. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You may have health care, but you don't have cool milk innovations. That's right. <laughs> Priorities, man. <laughs> exactly. All right. And speaking of things that got to take priority in your day, a Zwift race, like no spring chickens. <laughs> like nails ready. on a chalkboard, Brett. Love it. <laughs> still that, still better than uh, Richard's last week. <laughs> <laughs> Worth it for the groans and the eye rolls. Though. I regret I nothing. It. <laughs> no, it was perfect. It was perfect, I assure you. That's the best part of missing recording the Pinktron is listening to Pinktron. <laughs> All right. So the herd no spring chickens race number one is McCurry 40 in the McCurry Islands. Um it it's it's the longest route in McCurry. It starts let's see if I can remember this because I have race. It starts at the Castle Pens. Right, no, starts at no. the other pens. Well, castle pens being the ones that go up the hill to the castle, I guess. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. The ones close to the castle in the Umezi part of McCurry, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then goes up and around Umezi over into Neokyo, does a bunch of Neokyo, then goes down through the wind caves into um Urakazi. And you go all the way to Shisa Sprint, right? All the way over yeah, Shisa so Sprint, you, up Shisa Sprint. You do it kind of the backwards one, the one that you don't do the little like loop de loop. Yep. It's the one that's on pavement the whole time and is actually like that's I think the easier way up that little hill. Yeah, I think that's right. And then, yeah, you do get to skip Mech Isle. So then you come back around Mech Isle, but you don't do the Mech Isle climb. So you get to skip that, which is kind of nice. 
on the outside of Mecca Isle, but then you come up the uh, I don't know what do you call that that rise that goes up between Umezi and Urakazi. I can't remember what that's called. Dirt anyway, the, the canyon climb. The canyon climb. I, I think that's the right word for it. Up up the canyon climb, which is always what I like to call the land that hope goes to die. And then you finish <laughs> on the uphill direction into the the blue banner finish at uh, just before you get to the castle. Which is right after the lap banner. So you go through the lap yes. banner and then there's like a few hundred meters until... The, the craziest tricky ending. I don't understand what they were thinking when they built this, but yes, there is a, a lap banner and then a finish banner that comes about 500 meters afterwards on the uphill. Oh, uh, this is the crazy incline blue banner finish? Yeah, that's the one. Oh, gosh. It is brilliant. Okay. Uh, if I've just shared with you, you, you guys on the chat we have, if anyone follows me on Strava, Zwift uh, you know, records some video from the ride, and it's managed to get that sprint. And I absolutely nail a guy uh, in the sprint who's just done a steady attack, and I've literally gassed the last 100 meters and sprinted past him on the glide. Um, yeah, I, I really like this course. Um I think it was you, Sean, who said it, it's basically a four-minute power test at the start. <laughs> but then pretty much until about 25Ks, you have to be basically daydreaming to get dropped. Um, it does mean that people will try try little half-hearted attacks to get those people. Out of, uh, people would randomly just sort of roll through and just put a, a little effort in, and you'd have to up a bit to tempo to sort of hold in the group. And I know, Sean, you were saying that your group, anytime it hit dirt, people would just put the power down and just see if they could drop some people. But it, they weren't really kind of, in our group anyway, they weren't really kind of big attacks. So I think you're right that, like, you kind of got to be daydreaming to get dropped once you've made a group. Uh, the downside is that that 20-something K is so boring that it induces daydreaming. Uh, so, <laughs> so, like... I, nobody did get dropped in those uh, bits out of our group, but uh, there, there, yeah, there were some pushes. There was, there was definitely a guy. So uh, John was also in in our group, uh, and there were, there, there were, there were two people in our group that just really wanted to be pushing for whatever reason. Um, there were two guys that got dropped. Two Belgians. Yeah, that's somewhere true. in you, Maisie. I don't, I'm not sure where it was. Uh, no, it was. I remember it was. Uh, so one of the guys uh, in the little castle area in Neokio, uh, there, one of the guys was off the front, and I pushed to catch him uh, up that that little hill going up into the like castle park yeah and they got they were like two seconds off the back there and they never caught back on because there was somebody in our group who just sat on the front at like 3.5 3.6 for like most of the race um, and like just whoever got dropped couldn't push hard enough to to get back on I think the flip side of that 20K is being really dull is it's quite a lot of time to recover. Um, I basically went as hard as I could up that climb at the start, um, chasing Sean as, as hard as I could. Couldn't keep up with Sean. Um, and then made a group. Uh, and I think it's interesting. I think because it's e even before you get to the sh shitty climb, as Ben calls it, sprint, um, that climb there, I think, it's, it's still quite a long way to the finish and you've got the canyon climb as well. So I think people are almost afraid to put big attacks in there because they think they might be then caught back again. Um, so we had some kind of people making it tough on the front and you had to sort of sit and hurt, but you could sit in the draft. And so for our group, kind of sitting in the draft was about two and a half watts per kilo. Um, and then some people would occasionally try and do four on the front and you might have to boost that up a bit. But I mean, we've all sat and done TTTs. You know, you can sit in the draft kind of at high twos, three, when someone's on the front at four and and not die. And I don't think the the, the climb 
the, the she she says sprint climb that way round is actually quite draftable, isn't it? I found I found the other way tougher. I think it's a bit steeper, maybe a bit shorter as well. So I think people can put some like punchy efforts in and kind of drop people that way. But this one mm -hmm. wasn't the case. Tyler O'Callaghan tired. That was what I thought. <laughs> I think he got um I think he got a mechanical to it. Matt was saying he dropped. Oh, it. okay, okay. That would um, make sense. Tried to catch back on and then couldn't. Um But yeah, so okay. once you made the shooter climb, that that's that's actually it was surprisingly easy. I thought we were going the other way, which I found quite tough, but that that was um like a few little bumps, but nobody really put a big attack in on our group. But the 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 climb where hope goes to die as you can't is just brutal. I just it just feels like it never ends. So the the thing that I find interesting about this race uh is that so you've got that first four minutes, four to three, like three to five, depending on you know where you're at. Uh where you're going. Well, this is this is actually there's that part of the race determines what group you're in and the other climbs are of a similar length so there's there's some matchmaking that happens at the beginning uh that if you're not in the front group you're probably in a group that you are going to be approximate like pretty well matched with on the remaining climbs uh and so that while it means that yes, it's gonna hurt, it's gonna hurt just like just the same for everybody in your group, unfortunately. And so you're gonna have like it's not, oh, there they go. It's uh well, I guess I have to suffer for another 10 minutes up this last goddamn climb. <laughs> <laughs> um but the the thing that I find really interesting about this start is be like there is some, at least for me, uh, I went through many of the stages of grief, uh, and I think I, I, like, I mean, mostly I got stuck on bargaining, uh, where it's like, <laughs> this hurts. If I go harder, like, I had more to give, uh, in that first five minutes, uh, but if I get into, like, one, it's unlikely that it's going to get me into a significantly better group. Like, I may have been able to latch on to the very back of the front group. But then I'm dead, and I have 37K still to ride with nothing left. Uh, so there's, there's this, like, internal... Uh, low oxygen bargaining slash like calculus that you have to do about how deep you go in that first climb and whether it's actually worth trying to make a better group that if you make that better group, it means that the rest of the race is going to be hard. Yeah, I, I totally know what you mean. I kind of had that in the group I was in at the start that it took a while to settle down. So even in the, the easier bit after climb through to Nyoki, there were times where I'm sat at threshold to stay in the group. And the prospect of doing that, having done a kind of big effort and knowing that there's a couple of climbs coming up isn't isn't one that fills you with joy. Um yeah, oh. that, I find that can, that canyon climb, I always think I've just got to the finish as well. You're like, oh, it's just around this bend. And then you go around the bend, there's another little climbing bit. No, I must just be around this bend then. I can just never remember where the, where the end is. Well, I found with the different age group formats that, like, I was in serious bargaining mode at the end. Um, I mean, our group, Sean's, I think you said they went off at like eight or 900 meters. And that's a long way to go on that climb. And I was just realizing, like, I have no idea if I'm raising any of those people <laughs> in my age group. I was just gonna Chances say, are probably like, not. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't have anything left anyway. So it was quite early on in the chat. Somebody was saying, are there any 60 year olds in this group? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did, Kev, did Kev answer? 
He did. <laughs> I saw him say 61, and I'm like, all right. Yeah. I, I don't have any chance. Humble brag. <laughs> out of what, Kev? Uh, and he was only the, he, he only finished second among that age group. Uh, yeah. There was an A-plus in the 60-pluses. <laughs> I think the, the biggest shock of the day is Matt Tafratis losing in his group, wasn't it? Okay. Yeah, last place. Ooh. I love it. Yeah, Tom Check Morris. the results for the uh, passive in joke at Matt's expense there. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how long is this race? How long does the an suffering hour. go on for? It's an hour? Okay. Hour five for, for my group. Uh... And that was I think D, who was a D at the moment, did it in just under an hour to twenty. I, I did it in under an hour ten as a as a low C, so it's in that. Um I think most C's should do it sub an hour ten. Yep. Uh the front it's, group, always, my, it's always my goal to be under an hour. <laughs> 40, front, 40 it's almost exactly forty K. The front definitely finished fifty six something. Yeah. Um but getting getting under an hour required probably doing three point four ish for the hour. Yeah, the 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 seventeenth place has done three point three seven um, to finish in that front group in, uh, and actually they they must have got dropped because they've done just under an hour, fifty nine thirty two. What does three point two get you? An hour and four. By the looks of it. Simon M. 3.2. Put me down for it. 104. <laughs> what did we ride for bikes? Steve, I assume you're on a pink Tron. I, I nearly started on a TT bike. Because, um, the <laughs> last Interesting ride choice. Fortunately, I was organized and did a warm up tonight. So it was like, no, nope, we'll get off that and on the pink Tron. Oh. John, same. Venge and uh, Disc. I saw a lot of that. I did see, and I, I get that, uh, except for the fact that all of the separations here come on those climbs. Yeah, on the little hills. Like, I, I never felt because it's a long enough race. Uh, I never felt limited by bike on the flatter sections. It's also, where, like you say, it's not where the race is hard. If this was a points race, I'd, uh, I'd be like, yeah, 100% go that combo because um, it's got those horrific sprints through the castle section, which I was really glad we weren't doing tonight. Um, but I don't think any of the climbs are steep enough that you want a climbing bike. <laughs> so it, no. it, it is Tron, it's the air road. It's one of the good all-rounders. That, I think that... I think that... that... There's there is nothing really wrong with with going with the uh, with a vengeance disc or something like that because as you as you said even those climbs are pretty shallow like they were you know you're going twenty five k an hour up up them so you are still you are still moving um, but yeah. I was on. I was on Tron. Moving, there we go. I guess you might just think about how many, like, how many watts can you save, and how much will that buy you if you're on arrow, a full arrow for the whole race. But you, is that going to make up for being a little bit lighter on the move? It's probably a wash. I think it's it's Good. pretty steady on the flat. Like Matt, even Matt in the front group was saying like. His average watts was pretty low. Um, every so often, they, people would bump up and try to try to pump it a little bit. But I think it's it's just so every, everyone knows where the points are that are going to make a real difference. So. I think I was a little pessimistic that I'd be ITTing most of this race. I thought yeah. I'm I'm going to need to be as arrow as I can because I might have one or two people at with me at best, and it turned out better than that. Yeah. Yeah. So how was the turnout? I, there were 48, I think, signed up, uh, okay. or at least that left the pen. Um, the results are around 40. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I was I was a little apprehensive as well, uh, going out for a 40. Like, 
this is a long race for a like HWR style race where there's, you know, it's everybody starting at once and uh, like what happens in HWR often is you split off because you blow up. Uh, so there is potential for carnage, uh, but because it starts with a separation point, I think it ended up really nice for most people. Like I, you know, John and I ended up in a group right away with a group of about six or seven that was like, it was still five of us all the way to the end. So we, we rode together for 37 K. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's, I think it's a very fair summary of what you're likely to experience here. Yeah, we had a group of seven, I think, um, after the first climb uh, that stayed together pretty much till the end. I got caught out by Catherine D. Did a good attack. Uh, I think she's a dirt rider. She did a great attack over the gravel about 2Ks from the finish and just gapped and or, almost like TT to the finish rather than doing a sprint at the end on that climb. So. Is she, is she on good. dirt? She's on dirt now? Uh, yeah, that. Uh, she's also, there, or what uh, WKG? I can't remember. Yeah, but but also herd rider. I think she was uh, one of the penguins. Anyway, uh, she 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 does still have a herd tag beside her name. She does say herd. Oh, yeah. why did I think she was? Uh, anyway, one of those great moments of podcasting there. Um, <laughs> Did we get a fact wrong? I was going to say, are we going to have to bring in a fact check section? We have to get Sean to edit in the fact check on the Pinktron. God, it'd be as long as the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Brent's really, a good uh, cyclist. What, fact check. Nope. What I didn't realize was going to happen, possibly because I didn't read the Facebook post correctly, is Swift Power has automatically sorted results. So that's really cool. You can you check out Swift Power straight away afterwards and you can see your age cap results. Uh, so Sean and I are both C's. Um, I'm glad I wasn't relegated to um, to a lower category by this scoring system. Yeah, I don't know how that what it's going to do for like Zwift Racing app and all that other good stuff, but I guess we'll see. Good. Well, the series is away. It'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out. Um, Let's uh, move along to Herd Beginner Racing for the week. We are doing... Uh, Fem Flats, it Fem seems. Flats for... Um, from Nate, uh, three laps for the two highest categories and then uh, two laps for the lowest, the E subcategory. Yeah. And with the 4.5k lead in, like it's basically the lead in yep. in one lap. So, yeah, basically. So, it's going to be, oh, yeah, 19.5k for the longer route and 14.5k for the other ones. Um, it's the name pretty much says it all, beginner racers. It is the fan flats. There is, I think, one little section that goes to like two, three percent for maybe two or three hundred meters. Other than that, it is basically flat the whole way around. The finish line is at the sprint banner, which is just after the U-turn. By the time you get to your third lap, you should know where that is, probably. Um, Hopefully. <laughs> take your best aero bike you got. And I don't know there's much else to say about it other than that. Probably sit in and win the sprint if you can. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I remember from previous sprint rounds, the only thing that might cause some things there are some cobbled sections so it's, i don't know if with the new uh terrain changes it might affect uh, things but yeah it will probably come down to a sprint anyways yeah do you i don't i don't know about you guys when i race that richmond stuff i don't find those cobbles change the race for me at all like i just it's so the first part of it is it's so long so everybody's gonna be on the same stuff for so long anyway and then it's not i don't know it doesn't 
change really how the bikes feel in terms of speed and stuff. Like maybe you scrub one or two kilometers an hour at most. So everything is the same. I mean, you sit in the draft the same, you sprint the same, like it just doesn't really change my race at all. And no one is seeing, oh, there's cobbles I should attack here. It's that no one yeah. like sees it and makes it harder. So Yeah. Well, it's definitely not Belgium. Belgium uh, cobble, so <laughs> it is not. No. So, um, yeah, good, good for on our HBR racers get out there. Um, again, just if you are listening to this for the first time, you're being a racer. It's just a scratch race. So the finish line is just the finish line. You don't have to worry about points or KOMs or sprint times or anything else. All right, that will bring us to Climbers Gambit, Chris. Oh shoot, yeah. Um... Climbers Gambit. I hope everyone had fun getting up the leg snapper last weekend. Uh, I would have had more weekend. fun. If, is it you that beat me by a second and a half, Sean? Yeah, except it didn't count because I had I did it as a uh I was well, we'll talk about it when we talk about our uh oh, like, our continue our continuing <laughs> bike issues. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Well, now that that is behind us, we are going up everyone's favorite. We've been up it about 17,000 times, the Watopia KQOM. Um, so straight out of the, the downtown pens and right on the hill. What is that like? It's like a two and a half, three minute, four minute effort. <clears throat> Just right uh, out the gates. I think my PB's under Yeah, it's two. about two. Two. <clears throat> All right. So between two and four depending on where you're at, but um, key takeaway is you're right on the start line, pretty much right out of the pen. So come warm it up if that's your thing, but we'll be out of there in about 3K total. Uh, so a nice quick win this weekend as well. Good preparation for, for my, uh, we'll probably do this in the morning, uh, tomorrow morning <laughs> and uh, in the evening I have uh, a ladder race uh, downtown Titans, which has also the hilly K1. So nice recon. See which power I can produce. Love it. Yeah, I, I guess the definitely warm up. Hey, eh? I think on this one, you yeah. so it is like one K basically of the start line to the start of the climb. So be warm. <laughs> and then, uh, what do you guys when you guys re ride this like? I guess because this is like a TT style one, I don't know if it changes anything, but I always find that I'm a little less hard than others at the start and harder than others. At, like I always seem to catch onto the group back at the top. I don't know. I don't know if that's I, just me or. Yeah, I think it, it for this one, for Climber's Gambit, it kind of depends on how how well you know what your approximate two minute power is. Uh, yeah. because so when I know well, the, the first ramp is steeper, so you can make more time up there and you're fresher. Uh, so I will go over my expected power on that first part, uh, get a little quote unquote recovery doing like threshold, uh, through that flatter part. And then it's just like a minute of holding on and pushing mm -hmm. whatever I have left. Uh, but there's there is the other version of that where you kind of go at your target power a little below for the first half and then push whatever you've got left over that last uh, that last part, which, if you have more than you expect, could get you, you know, could make you up some time. Uh, yeah, I guess it just kind of depends on how well you think you know what you've got in the tank. Yeah, for me, definitely, it's uh, the, the first option. If I recall my previous attempts, I would usually go hard and you have that U-turn, indeed, that U-turn, flatter section, recovery a bit, and then just give it everything you have uh, uh, in that final uh, uphill section. So, yeah, it's about to see. Yeah. 
Fair enough. Uh, bike. I think full climber. It's steep enough for that. I mean, it's like hits eleven percent right at the start, so the speed scrubs off pretty fast. So, I think full climber. I think you're right. Uh, no. I haven't. I haven't made a decision on what I'm going to do yet. But if it's either going to be full climber or Tron. Yeah, I definitely yeah. would take anything heavier than Tron. Um, yeah, I was thinking that that, that second uh, second section is more suited for Tron, but that first section, like I said, is pretty steep. So, yeah, and I mean, it does. There is a little flat finish bit that, yeah, you might get a little juice on the arrow if you're sprinting out at the end, but so either of those. Average so for my best effort, uh, average sixteen point three miles an hour. Uh, so and I, I was on a Tron for that, um, and that was in a climber's gambit. Um, mm. I, that's pretty fast. Uh, that's at 5.8 watts a kilo or so for two minutes. Um, so if you, if you're faster than that, I would say Tron. Uh, if you're significantly below that, I would say climber bike. That makes sense. Cool. Good. I think that brings us to herd of mountain goats. The mystery route yet again? Uh, it seems my three metropolitan. If I look at the at the overview of the uh, schedule, okay, it's not in the tab. Got it right. Yeah, it isn't filled in the tab, but it's on the home schedule. Yeah, mighty metropolitan is going to be a bunch of New York nonsense. Pretty tame for for uh, for it seems for for uh, mountain goats to twenty kilometers only three hundred meters of elevation finish at that uh, at the uh, lab banner at the uphill sprint section. But I'm I'm gonna the... bet I'm gonna bet yeah it's not updated yet and it's gonna be a custom and it's gonna be a lap and a half finishing at the second K. Yeah. Yeah, up there, yeah, the, the only one is the New York KOM reverse, so it might finish indeed on that, and it's about a 30K-ish. Yep. If it's... Yeah, so I, the lap and a half, probably. Yeah, I think if you're racing Mountain Goats, you better count on it being a lap and a half of Mighty Metropolitan. Yeah, I was about to say, if, if it's just one lap, it seems a bit tame. Or... The routes aren't yeah. updated yet. It's still showing them, you know, Mondo and Zwift hacks. Yeah, I was about, I was about to check. But yeah. So, yeah. I, I think we should bet on it being, yeah, 30, 30K um, up the KOM, back down, around the outside bits. We can rename it Mountain Guess. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, I guess the steep part there. Yeah, there's some steep nonsense in the normal new rolling bit, but twice up to New York, KOM reverse, technically. Which are each 1.1 kilometer, 5.7%. They are very steep. Yeah, it's uh, the climb for people that do not know it's the stair steppy climb. Yeah, you're probably going to get a pretty, pretty chill rollout for the first 10k and then it'll be full gas to the KOM and then it'll all be broken apart <laughs> pretty much so have fun all you mountain goats all right and that would bring us to the stampede which we are doing two laps of classic this week so we start at the london pens do the 5.7k lead in up through 
um, the Flam Rouge and on to through the Admiralty Arch and on to the mall, and then it does the classic loop around the mall twice, which is pretty flat. So kind of a little punchy bit up Northumberland Street, but other than that, pretty much just sit on your power and try and get 16.5K on that route. Bees, fast bees will probably be 24 minutes, I think. A's will be in the 22-ish type minute range. C's and D's. 26, yeah. Yeah, D's probably can get it in half an hour, I would think. Yeah. Over 33K an hour. Should be all right. So, Brent, do you do a general classification for the whole uh, series of 10? Uh, yep. So it's by points. By so points. Okay. It's um each each week is a hundred points. The yeah. fastest time across all this the stuff gets a hundred points, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then your best eight of ten results count. Okay. So we're on. This is week um, nine. 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 So right now, for example, in the bees, there's only one guy who's got all eight races in. Oh, sorry, two guys have eight races in, and there's a handful who have seven in. Any good battles um, going on? Yeah, the C's is uh, 17 points from Peter Knapp, who's usually pretty up there. Uh, D's, there's two who've done them, all of them. Paul Lutman does his. It'll be an interesting battle for second and third. A, Kev Fowler's got seven in. He's run away with the thing. Not too many other A's have finished up. But the B's. Yeah, Hirschberger and Stag are one point apart right now. So, and they both got seven races. So their next one and then their best one of the next one counts. So they'll definitely be out there trying to smash each other to try and see you can win. That's a real good fight. The, the guy in front of him, I think they're 40 points behind him. Ah, that'll probably be for the number. That'll probably be for first place between yeah. uh, Rob Hirschberger and Jamie Stagg. Both, I used to, Jamie Stagg and I have had like some, a lot of close races. I think he beat me last series, but Rob Hirschberger has pretty consistently beats me. I think I've maybe nipped him a couple times, maybe, but both very good B time trailers. So, yeah, gets, it, I have not been racing because I've been trying to do longer stuff on Sundays, slash my bikes are broken, slash I've been traveling. So, sorry, Stan Peters. <laughs> All right, and that brings us to the bullseye Wednesday. Which is not listed here unless I need to re refresh the page again. Yeah, um, the Guardian it's on the, first. Yep, it's on the bullseye tab. There is one. Gotcha. Now I've never, I can never remember this. <laughs> is that the uphill sprint or the downhill sprint? <laughs> uh, the, the downhill sprint. Print, I think not with uh, going up uh, the the ramp and that. No, then then it's the slightly uphill sprint because the forward is when you get that little kicker and it goes down a bit through the banner, so it's the other way around. Yep. It's where you come from uh, the intersection with where you go up the. Glassy roads up to the New York Caravan. It's that. It's not yeah. That. Yeah. So it's the yeah clock, clockwise one. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of a, the, the sprint spot itself spot. is a bit of a dish. Yeah. It's a little yeah. bit down, a little bit up at the end. Yeah. But, but it's, yeah, not it's not much. the one where you climb in and then it's downhill into it. Yeah. Seems seven laps, eight sprints. Yeah. Lead in. Until the banner and then seven laps makes sense. Yeah, I don't. The only thing I guess to watch for is it is hilly coming out of the sprint. Like there's kind of a you're going down that thing and then that bypass is a little bit rolly and then it comes back up when it goes to the other side. So you got to just make sure you don't get dropped just in case yeah. when you're gassed coming through those sprints. And it's a pretty shortish lap, I think, 3, 3, 3.5K, if I remember correctly. 
Zero says two point eight Swift Insider. Okay, so it's even shorter. Yeah, it, it comes up fast. And it's a tricky start. Like, I mean, I know it's it's bullseye, so you don't really need to like see the start of the sprint segment per se to see where the banner is, but it is like around a turn. I find it always a bit tricky to time where the finish is of this like where you're trying to hit those that banner so if you see people i say from the corners a little far but once you're past that corner it's not too much further so get ready Oof. uh i just looked at what the no spring chickens is next week and it is a longer and maybe a bit harder race than this week's cool uh <laughs> what is which, it which will not have a nice way to break everyone up right at the beginning so it's a custom finish on cast pat uh 43k so it's almost more two, than a lot it's almost two full laps but the finish is going to be at the top of the petit kom yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the second petite KOM. Yeah. Interesting. Uh so the either that's the, the, like the the first place that this this really has uh potential to break up is the aqueduct. Aqueduct. Yeah. yeah I was about yeah. to say that but that's a clockwise version where you have the first like 10k flat aqueducts, then a little bit bumpy, and then up the petite KOM, the but actual. For a lot of us, that means that the first 15k is going to be brutal. Uh, just hanging on to the group that I'm, I'm sure there is going to be attacks going off the front and lots of lots of early dumb stuff. Uh, where we're just trying to survive. Uh, and then, again, this is this is me pre-bargaining. Uh, <laughs> like, is it better to drop a little earlier just so that you don't have to suffer so much when you get to the KLM? <laughs> well, it, it's going to depend, right? I'm sure we'll go yeah. more in depth on this next yeah. week, but size of group, composition, location. Yep. Yeah. All of the above. It's a fun five-dimensional puzzle. Oh, but luckily, I'm not going to be in town next week. Darn. I'm going to oh. have to miss it. Oh. Where are you <laughs> going, and can I join you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, friend friend is throwing a uh, like camping birthday party festival type thing, so I'm going to be out nice. of town for that. I mean, you could always just go ride cast pads as hard as you want for fun. <laughs> that's true <laughs> I, could bring I feel my like bike. I'd, I'd ridden cast pats enough in group rides but I never really noticed any of those little undulations until I started racing it right like mm -hmm. those little like 100 meter 2% things and it's like wait there's, there's an incline here and then people are just off the front trying to break everybody it's like oh I, I should pay attention to this I guess well, the other big difference about racing on any of those flat French courses compared to um, like just riding around in them is that the the Aqueduct KOM, especially the One Direction, starts about 500 meters before the Aqueduct KOM starts. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're almost done by the time you get to the beginning of the climb. Like, yeah, they, they really start sending it off before before the climb bit starts. You get on the bridge and stuff. So, yeah, good fun. This is also the direction that uh, ATP... Uh, just starts attacking for no reason about 5k in. And and they're bound to be in road races. I've seen them lots of them before. So I wonder if you can like bribe someone who's like on your team but who's in a different age group than you to like just drag you around. Like go hard, but don't go too hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'll mention you on the pink draw. <laughs> yeah. Ask, ask, ask John. It, yeah, I that's what that. that's what I was doing today. <laughs> yeah. There you go. 
All right, that brings us to, I think, around the horn. We're going to talk about what, more mechanical troubles and all that good fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, Chris Chris had uh, a science experiment, but his bike didn't break. Yeah, not yet anyway, I guess. Right. Yeah, did, no, I did thought you get I that? had a... Well, yeah, I was going to say, I thought I had um, a spare handlebar, but it's the wrong bar diameter for my current stem. So I either got to get shims, which I don't have, or still invest in a new handlebar. Well, you could use Miller Lite. That's a good shim. That's true. If I cut enough of these cans on the side. And are you thing. full like, uh, are you like, you would like put on handlebars and like rerun all the cables and all that stuff? Or do you just not even do that now because you have play or click or whatever? Well, here's the thing. Like, um, so the rusty bike, the rusty handlebar bike is essentially like the one that I, that is fully tuned and road ready oh no but the only reason that was on the the trainer is because the backup one had the cable snap so this past weekend i recabled uh, as much as i was able to my quote-unquote dedicated trainer bike so that's back on the trainer now with intact uh handlebars so that's oh. good and then i can move forward with a handlebar swap on the the one that i can actually ride outside and uh I'm ready to rig up the pink lights on my trainer bike too. So that's going to be a cool little uh, disco show in the garage. Love that. Yeah. I mean, you're building yourself a pink Tron. Effectively. Yeah. Yep. So, but it sounds like from the troubles that everyone else is having, I'm on the, the happy side of mechanicals at the moment, which I never would have thought a couple of weeks ago. Well, the, I mean, I, I guess, well, I, you guys have all heard the story, but um, so basically I was riding in a Rando's ladder race on Tuesday night. And so on the Sunday on the weekend, oh, I guess how far do we want to go back? So I've got FSA Omega cranks on my bike and the way they, they're, they're thread and the way they thread on is just with like a six mil or eight mil hex wrench. You just stick it in there and tighten it up. And like when I, about two years after I first got the bike, the left crank arm fell off, I took it into the LBS like where I bought it from. And they're like, oh, that's weird. Here, they fixed it all up. It's fine. And I'd never had any problems with it until maybe like two years ago doing Zwift riding, a lot more Zwift riding on it than I'd ever had before. And then it got kind of loose and I just like, oh, okay, I just got to tighten this up. And then like a year ago, I need to get tightened again. And then like a month ago, I need to get tightened again. And then on Sunday I was riding it and it like came loose again and it feels weird right because it, it just like feels like loose like it feels like you're actually your cleat is not tight in the pedal is what it actually feels like because your foot kind of shakes side to side you get used to it and then you're like okay i gotta fix that so i tied it up on sunday didn't ride on monday and then tuesday riding with the randos i made it i warmed up no problem and then 5k into our race my left crank arm falls right off on the ground so i mean <laughs> could i have picked it back up and screwed it back in and finished for one point probably thankfully they won the race so i don't feel too bad about that but it, it is now apparent at this point that the threads i think are just shot they're just worn out essentially from i don't know i don't know what the failure point was on these threads or why it wears out from use if it's just little subtle movements over time just loosen them off or whatever but Get a new pair of cranks. Terry Rigby has has uh, shipped me some old cranks from a bike he's got laying around. So, so these will work. I'm like, okay, great. So I'll uh, get those. Hopefully, put on for Saturday. That says they're out for delivery to my house right now. So that's you don't think it's my... the spindle on the bottom bracket that stripped the threads on the spindle? Uh, he's sending me like that part too. The, the, he's the got, bottom like, bracket fit too. spacers yeah. that go with the cranks. Yeah. Yeah, because nice. it could be, you're right, it could be some, it's a combination of it, right? Yeah. Of the cranks cranking, you go tightening into the bottom bracket, so. So, anyway, not uh, fun, but. So did it just, you're you're still clipped in, so did the thing just, like, come, your, your foot just, you your foot goes to the ground, and then you're just step standing on, like, you've, you've got a, yeah, a crank literally dangling like, from your foot? I did, 100%. <laughs> I almost took a picture of it like that. <laughs> It was just, yeah, it's just hanging off your cleats on, you're standing there going, whatever. And, I, you know, you're right. At, it was literally on breakaway Bray, the first like attack point in this race. And, you know, I just, I, I think I went, 
ah, oh, my crank arm just fell off. And Daniel Hopkins, the psychologist, goes, seriously? I'm like, yep, <laughs> fuck, sorry. And then I just, like, I knew it was going to be nothing but a stream of all the worst curse words in the world. So I just ghosted the Discord, quit out of the race. I was like, ugh. Uh, started searching up crank compatibility. <laughs> my version of that crank. was uh was in like on the uh, leg snapper uh, climbers gambit this week. I had done I had done one on Saturday, uh, and I this is the series that I'm like I'm gonna try in the bees. Um, and unfortunately, I did just realize like I'm not gonna get all the five races because I'm gonna be gone next weekend. Uh, but I did a I did an effort on Saturday, hungover, a little hungover. Uh did all right, did a did did a good time, but I was like, I want to try, I want to get a better effort in on Sunday. And I got into a race. Chris was in there. There was like actually, I don't know, 20 bees signed up or something. So I was like, yeah, okay, good this is like I'm 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 gonna get a good estimate of where I'm at relative to the bees uh with my short power. Uh did a good warm-up and um I'm I get to the to the hill. Um and I think we had talked about like the best way of doing it is like sprinting into the base. You've got like that that little lead in where it's it's really nice to have some uh have some speed going into it. I start spinning up and my chain drops as I'm like two pedal strokes in, uh, but I had gotten up to speed and now I'm like past the line and at the bottom of the, uh, at the bottom of the hill. Like, well, I, again, time for some expletives. Um, <laughs> get the chain back on and I, try to crank it and it, it's like the weirdest feeling it's there's like so much resistance but it's not actually like turning the uh the trainer like the it's not turning the flywheel and if i uh if i rotate back it it just goes loose right so the the free hub is not free uh and i'm looked down as i'm Riding and I realize, oh, it's actually uh, I'm I'm spinning one of the cogs of the cassette without the rest of the cassette moving. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's not good. No, this was uh, so I I take my bike off the trainer. I uh, I look down and like the whole cassette is I can like wobble it back and forth. Uh, Similar to you, I had had some some issue there where uh, the uh, the lock ring was not fully tightened down. Um, oh, and this is you know I've been riding this this trainer for two years now, so it's not like this was a constant problem. But over time, I guess it loosened enough that. Uh, you know, I finally, you know, I'm doing sprint power and it just said, nope, we don't have, we can't hold on to that. Um, and then I, I tightened it, but I didn't do a good job of getting it in place beforehand. So I set the bike back up and it's, it's all over the place. It's wobbling back and forth. It's like, ah, this is, I did eventually get it back on. And I, uh, with my newfound, uh, my newfound rage, at my bike and my trainer uh ended up doing i think a 47 up uh innsbruck ring or up up the leg snapper at like eight eight plus watts a kilo so i was and apparently uh pritchard was was in innsbruck and saw me doing something like switched over to watch and was just like what are you doing man <laughs> venting clearly yeah, it's smashing the hell out of this hill like what else do you do when you're in the rook yeah uh well that's so so did it like it, like the the free hub or has like all those little oh i don't know mine i've only really from a strand it has like the lines right where the the cassette like grabs it 
And so does it, it just wasn't grabbing that. It was just spinning around those. I was on the smallest cog. Like, at, like when yeah. I was trying to get this figured out, I'm like moving around. I got it That's into like the smallest cog and it. I'm like, and I'm pushing. And that cog was off the, off of the splines and just yeah. like grinding around, which was, <laughs> I, I was almost certainly doing some, some, uh, Maybe not permanent damage to it, but like it wasn't probably not good for that cassette. Because that cog is threaded to go into the rest of the cassette and lock on the rest of the cassette. Yeah. So yeah, you were probably trashing the threads on that last little piece. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe Terry Rigby has a spare cassette he can send you. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's been fine since. Uh we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I guess at the end of the day, like it's just your trainer free hub and cassette, right? Like cassette in terms of bike parts is not the worst one after a place. And the free hub part, like I imagine you can just pull that off if you had to, but it's probably fine. It's just a trainer one, right? Yeah. I haven't had a mechanical in a long time, but I did have a very hilarious ghost mechanical. This is back before I was swifting, I was riding to work primarily as my biking. And I had decided I was going to ride fixed gear for a, a winter because it would make me stronger and less. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and so I was doing that and surviving most of the winter. <clears throat> and I come to one day and I got a flat on the bike and I don't have time. So I just grabbed the, the regular freewheel bike that's, Still got air in the tires. I got to get to work and I get out and I start pedaling down the street and it feels like there's this weird resistance at the top and the bottom of the crank stroke. And like, like there's a rubber band on my, on my chain somehow. And I get off and I look at it and I spin the cranks and I pick up the bike and spin the cranks forward and everything's fine. And I get on and do it again. And it still feels like there's this weird resistance that's pulling my legs backwards whenever my feet are at the top and bottom of the stroke. And, and I'm just like, I, I don't know what's going on. And I get into work and I talk to a friend of mine who's a bike racer and, and he says, yeah, you dummy, you're normally riding a fixed gear and the wheel is just slamming your, your uh, feet forward at the top and the bottom. You're not putting any strength into it. That's all your momentum on the bike that's pushing your feet forward. And when you're not on the fixed gear and you're on a freewheel bike, you have to provide all that energy. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. <laughs> but I was convinced there was something wrong with my bike. Uh, oh, I've, I, I mean, if you were talking about other weird mechanical ones, I mean, I had a situation with my triathlon bike, my TT bike, and, um, on those TT bikes, the the clearance on the frame and the wheels is like very low for aero purposes, right? Especially like yeah. the back one, like it clears the carbon by millimeters, millimeters. And I, I hadn't quite got the skewer seated or the in the um, dropout a bit, and it's a horizontal dropout or something, so it, it was like just a bit twisted in there. So, um, so the wheel was not clearing the frame it was rubbing against the frame on the tire well i didn't know and i think i was even like you know set it up for a race you spin it around it seemed okay and then like i get out in the race and it's like why does it feel like i'm pedaling through absolute mud right now like what is happening and then i'm like why does my bike smell like it's burning <laughs> and i i like got back and i'm like oh i figure out what's going on i take it into the lb i was like why is it doing that and he like oh that little like the little I don't know what the the grommet or whatever is that goes in the um, frame. It actually come loose from use or whatever. And he's like, "Oh my god!" I thought, like, I don't know how this tire didn't blow up. Like, you're like through the tire. <laughs> I wrote, you like, just shaved like, the rubber of the tire right down to the... <laughs> like twenty k oh like god. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that was a good one. I was riding around on, on the bike I'm riding now, and I and suddenly uh... like. What it, do you have a guess on how like how many kph did that cost you? Oh, at least five. I got a thing. Like it wasn't, yeah. Anyway, it was like I said, it was a twenty k race, so you know maybe I could have finished the bike in 
35 minutes maybe and it was like 38 something like that so anyway that was at the vulcan try i believe and then uh the one i'm on now after doing some stuff i'm riding along all of a sudden it starts making this and i was like ping 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 every pedal stroke and i'm like what is going on and i'd get off i could never replicate it when i was just doing the pedals with my hands i get back on a pedal bing 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 I'm like, what is happening with this thing so finally like one time i'm like pedaling i look and just the little like derailleur cable end on the front derailleur had just like twisted a little bit to the right uh, oh, so yeah. every time i like pedal i like hit this stupid cable and it would just go thunk, thunk, bing bing with your <laughs> shoe probably yeah not exactly the, uh yeah yeah, when you do it with your hands, or you don't quite put your hand in the exact same position as where your yeah. shoe goes around. So it's like, oh, so I crimped that back. No, it's fine. It's quiet again. <laughs> yeah, bikes are crazy like that. Although I guess I would be curious. Let's we could maybe finish off on this. Is like so. Like let's assume that this bike was like totally shot, and but money was no object, which it is. But let's just assume for the fun of a podcast. Would you guys go back to getting a bike on trainer, or would you get? something like a, a kicker bike so i kind of like was thinking about it. it's like oh what if my bike is shot so i started shopping around i'm like mm, i don't know like i've already got the trainer i ride a lot on zwift though yeah i've got too many bikes that's my problem i i i can't justify buying a a bike that doesn't go anywhere in addition to all the bikes i have Personally, I, because I like my outdoor, all my outdoor riding is on the same bike that I do my indoor riding, like, and I don't really have the space for it. I would have to just get another bike, but there is something really not like, I, I realized that I don't think I've done an outdoor ride in like three or four months now. <laughs> like it's starting to get nice out and I'm going to start doing that again, but uh, I, I could, I could see switch, like if I lived somewhere that, uh, wasn't so nice to do outdoor rides, like I could see switching over fully to just saying, yeah, no, I'm an indoor cyclist. Yeah. I mean, I've got my mountain bike, but I don't, I mean, you can put that on for Zwift, but I don't think it quite works that hot, frankly. <laughs> um, I just, uh, yeah, just I was thinking about like all the kilometers I put on my bike on Zwift, and I know it's not quite the same stuff, but like it does all the moisture, all the stuff that Chris has been dealing with. Mm -hmm. I mean, you put a lot of wear and tear on components just sitting there that like, I mean, that bike probably would have lasted me another 10 years at the amount of kilometers I was putting on it <laughs> if I just had something else that was just on the trainer or just a trainer bike that's designed to like put up with all the sweat and moisture and digital shifting and all the other sort of stuff <laughs> so, i think you know, if other I, family members were more into it it would definitely be uh worth it right if other people were going to yeah. jump on and you know mm. do a race or a long ride um yeah oh yeah are they are they more quickly adjustable because my wife does have like a little spin bike that she uses but yeah i think they are i mean relatively Quick, I mean, it doesn't require tools. At least the uh, mm. the kicker version doesn't. I don't know about the SV twenty. I think they're all you just like quick release, just boop, yeah, boop, move it back, and now like that's you just know that's where my seat goes. Uh, you can adjust where the handlebars and the seat is, and I think even they're the indexed. They have like little notches and numbers yeah. and letters on them. Yeah. I think even on the the kicker bike, you can. Uh, I can't remember if it's the kicker or the tax or whichever one, but you can even change what the effective crank length is. Yeah, kicker bike has that <laughs> for sure. Like you can. So there's like, like three different holes for the pedals. Oh, wow. And okay. you can like, if you move, Got if it. they're on here, it's like a 175. If it's here, it's like a 165 or something Got like it. that. And, or oh, yeah, maybe it's well, That's not quite quick release. No, but yeah, if you got a pedal wrench, you can quick, take them out pretty and put quick. them on. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, unless... um, Go ahead, Steph. Yeah, I was about to say, I have uh, now the, the the bike I use is my old road bike that we've been using for 
10 years switched April 2022 to a new road bike, joined Swift like a year ago. Like last uh, last uh, Saturday was my uh, Swift anniversary, <laughs> my first year on Swift. And uh, yeah, basically because I live in an apartment block on the top floor, basically that's uh, the bike uh, that I've now on my Swift hub is basically my indoor bike because I also have a dedicated outdoor bike because I ride very, you know, almost on a weekly basis in the weekends outdoor. So I think to get it off the trainer, back on the trainer, and I think the deal, I live on the ninth floor of, a, of an apartment complex. So, and I, and I could, technically can't use the lift to, 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 to move my bike. So, so. It just stays on on, on, the, on the trainer, no, and uh, have a dedicated bike for outdoor riding. So it's that lives on the ground floor. Yeah, yeah, you've got like bike storage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a if... sports storage room uh, in the apartment, in, uh, dedicated uh, for my storage. And there, uh, this is my expensive bike. Uh, my like my normal. Day to day work bike is is just in the communal bikes, bike uh, storage space. But so if you, with the road. so if your trainer bike broke and you know money was no object, would you get another trainer bike or would you just say no? I'm getting a kicker bike. After I, I have to think about it. <laughs> uh maybe it depends on uh what's what's the problem with the bike because uh, at a certain point while trying to move my bike uh the the rear derailleur came came loose but i brought it to my local bike shop and it just uh luckily some uh, it wasn't uh broken off so they, they couldn't mount it back so if right, you can if someone, keep it if someone came to you tomorrow and said you can either have this, you know, kicker bike or uh, a Wahoo Five with, a, you know, a I don't know whatever low end Tiagra or something on it that you're just going to leave on it. Would you? Would you? Yeah. Would you take the kicker bike or would you want the trainer uh, the, or some other thing on the, it? Depending if I have the have the money for it and uh, can can afford the expense, may maybe yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because I spent a lot of uh, like. Uh, Still a decent amount of time indoors. Uh, now with uh, the training, I spent two or three days uh, during the week working out on, on the indoor trainer. So, yeah, I don't like I said. I, I was always on Sean's boat that I always justified that I never would want to get the trainer bike because I I want the bike I ride on the trainer to be the bike I ride on the road. But the more I realize how much you wear and tear you can actually put on your bike on the trainer. <laughs> Or I think it might be, you know, get the sizing right and how much different is it really? Yeah, and it's even if uh, even if I didn't live on the like ninth floor floor floor, it's just because uh, it was an old bike uh, I could use, but having to to connect it to the uh, to the, the hub, get it off. <laughs> It's just such more easy to keep it on one place and have a dedicated bike uh, for outdoor riding. I just have to and have to deal with the hassle of getting it off and on the trainer. What yeah. are you, Chris? What do you want to put in the garage? Man, um, I like the flexibility of having an extra rig that you could take off the trainer. Like, there's something to be said for that, but. Yeah, I'd probably I'd probably go extra bike and bolt on. But yeah, I, I agree that dedicated indoor is really, really tempting. Some of those offerings are nice. Yeah. Although uh, uh, yeah, so I, I it is it's not an obvious choice for sure. I will say I saw someone post about the kicker shift that they figure they lost like one or two hundred watts in their sprint on Zwift from getting switching from a regular kicker to a kicker shift because of the way the forward the back thing worked they just couldn't get torque anymore oh, <laughs> whether that was legit or not i don't know but anyway hmm. 
develop those new ones that come with all that. And that's, I mean, I guess that'd be the other fun part of getting like, like I assume none of us here have like climb or any of that jazz, do we? No, that's, no. Yeah, that, that, that would be does the other seem thing. nice. Is like to get in the kicker bike is like it actually like elevates up on you. It'd be kind of cool. Yeah, it would be kind of cool. Someone just needs to drop me a big pile of cash in my. Well, I need just... to have it at the at the fitness center, right? You need to be able to walk into whatever. Brett, that would be good too. Brett yeah. just just start embezzling county funds. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Lord. <laughs> I will tell you about <laughs> some of the residents that we have in town and what they think is happening afterwards. I don't want to <laughs> put it, put it on a, on a, as an expense. Uh, yeah, that's right. I'll just expense it. I'll expense it. <laughs> Are kicker bikes even available in Canada? Can you get them? <laughs> you can. You can. Milk, you man. I no, think no. you have to go through a dealer, though. <laughs> you get all your your milk your illicit milk and a kicker <laughs> bike too check it out check it out oh my god by the by, by the way can, can it's uh this worth play is it still not uh being able to ship to canada or is it still not we, we just this week we did get you can now get the wahoo or, or the like the wahoo zwift Kicker thing with the cog and the click that oh, is now available in Canada this week, and the and the one year subscription that whole deal is here. It is a thousand dollars Canadian. So Sorry. so that, that 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 came last. The Swift Play came about six months ago, or even less, and that's still not available. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Although to be fair, they can't get that stuff in New Zealand or Australia potentially. I can't remember. I saw when they put the post up in Swift. Riders, I saw somebody from New Zealand complain, like, we can't get this here. What are you going to do it for us? So, you know, it's hard off as because Canadians are. There's other people just as hard off, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah, my, yeah. It's, it's been working pretty good, uh, although this race, this latter race, uh, it's, uh, it was a bit, the connection was a bit uh, dodgy. It kept, kept connecting and disconnecting. <laughs> thing. At certain points, so uh, yeah, Brent, it is what it is. Are you are you uh, are you ordering one to to ship to Chris's house and then picking it up on the at the race? Oh yeah, you a, a can bike do that. or Swift plays. Swift play. Well, there's a there's a former cast member who had picked one up who I might be able to make arrangements with. Hmm. So we've talked about it. So I'm hope I am hoping I am coming home with them theoretically. I'll be in so. BC in April if you need. I can hand them off through the fence, the go. border. Well, no, I'll be on the <laughs> I'll be on the Canadian the way, yeah. side, but uh, no, not, okay. not that well, close this... to Brad. Uh, yeah, I find them find them quite enjoyable if they don't keep connecting and disconnecting uh, the the virtual shifting the everything. The steering is so sometimes fun uh, at the ladder race. So was at the end with me by myself with four or four of the, the, the opponent's team and <laughs> one, uh, one or two. I have uh, steering as well with the Swift player. They have it as well. <laughs> we were being erratic and playing with the, with the, with the, with the steering to get me out of the craft uh, of one of their riders, the rest of the group. It's kind of oh. fun, but yeah. We were on a, a ladder race, not this one that I dropped out of, but the one before on on Lock Loop doing breakaway Bray. The guy was steering the inside, and it looked like he was riding on the grass around the thing. Like it was like <laughs> right off the course. It's like okay, <laughs> this this feels cheaty. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, that's a fun sort of segment of assorted Swift nonsense to end the podcast. I think. I think on that note, we will say thank you to Chris Greenland. Thank you to John Keenan. Thank you to Steph Etchen. Thank you to Sean Fogelberg. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks for everyone doing herd races. Enjoy your no spring chicken races this weekend and all the rest. Moo and good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Moon.